Thank you very much, uh, Elaine, Andrew. And really, first, I would like to thank uh, WADM, the organization, for actually giving the opportunity to Venezuela to speak through my voice and to show you all some of the issues that actually we are facing in the country. And um, I hope that through this talk, you can also be uh, senders of these problems and that we can raise together more awareness towards this complex humanitarian health crisis that we are going through in Venezuela. It is certainly an emergency. Um, I am from Venezuela. I still work in Venezuela, although I live partly in the Netherlands. Um, and definitely this uh, situation, some of you may have uh, been acquainted through the news or actually maybe you're from there. Um, the needs, we need to have action. So Venezuela has actually plunged into a humanitarian and economic crisis, especially in the last four years, uh, but it has been progressively coming into this in the past 10 years. And the last four years, has really increased and uh, become a, a, a great crisis to the point to have people, as you see in this picture in the below right uh, part of the slide, uh, eating and having to find their food from garbage left in the street. Now, this situation uh, came uh, due to the mismanagement and political and economic really mismanagement um, that uh, produced the severe economic crisis. And um, this progression of this not well managed country came to the, to the climax in 2013 when the oil prices plummeted. As you see here, uh, maybe you can see the cursors that are moving. These are the, in these graphs are shown the oil prices. And in 2013, they, they really decreased. And this caused the collapse of economic and, and the country. So despite that Venezuela had a huge income, as you see in the bottom part, um, the actually expenditure, as you see in this graph here and the upper part, has been higher than the production, which is this uh, third line below. So this slowdown in production uh, was tried to be compensated because the oil prices could not do all by um, actually uh, entering into huge public debt. And which, as you see here in this uh, graph of the blue columns, has increased through the years. And this kind of could not be sustained. And eventually, the economy collapsed. Um, this economic collapse and increase uh, of economic crisis has been, can be seen here also in the increasing rates of inflation that have gone through the country. And in fact, uh, it comes to some numbers that are difficult to understand. So since probably the past almost 20 years, we have now an accumulated hyperinflation of 45,000%. And by the end of the year, it is estimated that this inflation will uh, reach 1 million percent. So this is difficult to understand. What does this mean? It means that practically your money uh, is worth nothing. Um, well, with this economic situation, you can imagine that it's not surprising that the poverty levels um, increase and increase especially dramatically in the last four years, where we now reach, as we see here on the upper uh, right corner, that the poverty levels, uh, the 90 percent of the almost 90 percent of the population live in poverty and more than 60 percent uh, live actually in extreme poverty in this column here. So people uh, in, in a big part of the country live in slums and try to make a living in this type of uh, situation. This has derived into what we call now a complex emergency. It's not just a, a, a crisis of one sort, it's really complex. It's on the legal, health and economic uh, um, uh, part. And it has led to food, and medical shortages, increasing poverty and inequality. Also, this in, leads to the increase in informal economy, which uh, uh, all impact on having a, the health situation is, has become very critical. And we all had experience, I think there is no person in the country who had not experienced a violent 
uh, situation with criminality in, in the country. Well, if you live in a country with all this, um, what do you do? Well, two options. Some people decide to stay and be resilient and continue uh, to survive or to fight for uh, a change in the country. But many others desperate decide to leave. And this is the exodus that maybe you have seen in the news that is currently occurring, especially in the last two years with massive emigration of people from Venezuela. And even actually the criminals uh, are leaving because they don't find people enough people to now rob. Well, it is, it is funny, but it's sad at the same time. So this situation, and I'm going to concentrate mainly on what has been the impact on the health uh, system uh, of this crisis. Venezuela was once really a regional leader of uh, vector control and, and public health with very good programs. However, the collapse in, in all the aspects of the Venezuelan system uh, means that recent uh, research has shown that 60 percent of the health system is not working, has been reduced, especially in the last five years. And this is because the hospitals have entered into crisis due to budget cuts from the Ministry of Health or the government. There have been incredible shortages of medicine and medical materials with people queuing, as in the right uh, lower picture, queuing to get medicines in front of pharmacy. The public, public services have deteriorated. We have, we have regular or actually irregular water and electricity supply deficits. I wanted to say we have regular cuts. So this is, you know, one day you have electricity for a few hours, next day you don't and water comes and goes, maybe you have water twice a week. Um, apart from just uh, all the people leaving the country, we have also trained professionals leaving, especially the medical personnel. Well, if you think that a full medical professor earns less than $10 a month, and these are the high uh, standards, uh, high professions, you can imagine the ones who are uh, earning less, how can they make a living? At the same time, since October 2014, there was no information or epidemiological information from the Ministry of Health. The report stopped to come out publicly. And then there was a progressive dismantling of the surveillance and control programs. There have been many protests all throughout this year from the health personnel, as you see in the picture below. And therefore, with all this situation, the health centers have been overloaded with patients, especially emergency unit, and at the same time, the picture on the right uh, below corner shows a closing of hospital areas, like in the hospital where I work. Um, this is a pediatric unit of neonatology, which was closed, uh, two or three areas. Uh, all the materials, all the equipment is there, but there are just no nurses to, to run and very few doctors. So they had to close down. Um, the massive short of medici medicines, we lived through this, especially in 2014 to 2015, uh, where there was a big epidemic that I will show later. And there was these queues, enormous queues of people trying to get medicine so much, as shown in the lower picture, that police had to be brought to pharmacies in order to keep, in quotes, order. Um, so. The, finally, two days ago, the Director General of the World Health Organization um, had admitted in a press conference that the Venezuelan health system had been reduced by 20%. Well, he's a bit short, as I showed you before, because the national data um, performed by academic institutions shows that it's actually 60%. But at least there is finally some recognizance, international recognition, especially by the WHO, that there is a huge problem in, in the country. So what could be the consequence of this? On the health part, we have a resurgence in epidemics of diseases. For instance, we have an, in, an unprecedented uh, increase in malnutrition. We've never seen so many people, especially children, malnourished, but also adults. And um, you see in the picture, here on the left uh, upper part, um, sorry, um, where you have uh, an example of malnutrition and also a dramatic situation that is happening in the country where children are actually left 
to be cared by the grandparents. This woman is the grandmother of these two children that are shown there because the parents either leave the country or move into another part of the country to find better earnings and to try to maintain their family. And you see this little child, this blonde child, he looks so cute. Well, actually, the blonde hair is uh, a sign of severe malnutrition of the syndrome that is called Quashor Core, where children lose the color of the hair, the pigment, and become blonde. So the child actually should look like his brother, which is this one. And because of the severe malnutrition, he has lost the color of the hair. Now he's recovering, but he's probably never going to, re uh, to be yeah, completely recovered. And it's thanks to uh, really the heroic work of doctors, nurses, and uh, personnel and, and uh, non-governmental organizations that work together with the hospital that bring the special milk, like the one that, that the grandmother is carrying in her hand, um, to help these children to recover. But these are only the children who actually have access and for the few children that the, 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 the milk had, can be brought. HIV AIDS in Venezuela, there was an excellent program on, of treatment, free treatment for patients. And now obviously we see that more, almost 80,000 people are, are, have not been able to take the treatment since last year. Tuberculosis in the low panel has also increased, especially in the last three years, as you see here, really a huge increase. So these are, these are diseases that actually were controlled or, or even not, not seen much more, and now they're coming back. But the ones who are really having a big impact and have been seen mostly in the last year are epidemics that are coming from what is called mosquito-borne diseases, so the ones who are transmitted by mosquitoes. I will start with talking about the viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes and which are oh, actually insects and other uh, arthropods. This is what the name arboviruses means, arthropod-borne diseases. And um, three of them that you may know, one is dengue, the other one is Zika. Probably you have heard uh, last year where there was, the, two years ago, when there was the big Zika epidemic hit in Brazil just before the Olympic Games with the children and born uh, from mothers who had Zika with little heads. And chikungunya, which is the third one, this is a, a, a very strange African name for a virus. And all of these viruses are transmitted by the same mosquitoes, which is this one, which is called in, in, in Spanish-speaking country, patas blancas, or the, the, the mosquito with strip, striped legs. Um, now, these mosquitoes breed in clean water. They bite during the day. And uh, as, as you see here, like in barrels and clean waters that you have in your gardens or patio. Now in Venezuela, as in other countries, when you have problems in public services where regular water is not achieved at home, then people start to store water. That means that they are actually unwillingly placing very good uh, breeding sites for these mosquitoes, and then you have mosquitoes at home. <coughs> Excuse me. So dengue, for instance, we have seen, especially in the last uh, eight to nine years in this graph, we are seeing the number of cases and the epidemics are the peaks. So in the last uh, nine years, we see that the number and the magnitude of the, of the epidemics of dengue have increased. And our research shows that they, this is linked to poverty, to deteriorating public services and to climate. Now, in a country where dengue that is transmitted by that mosquito with the striped legs and you have these epidemics which means that the dengue is really not controlled this is actually a good and ideal setting for the other viruses that came and and were introduced into the americas chikungunya in 2014 and then zika in 2016 um, to really spread and this is what we predicted and exactly what happened so the first epidemic in 2014 was the one of chikungunya. Now, in the first graph of dengue in 2010, let me just go back. This was the biggest epidemic ever of dengue in 2010. In 2014, here's the epidemic of dengue, as I show in 2010, and look how, what is the magnitude of the epidemic of chikungunya. 
in 2014. And these are from reports which, as you see, they were stopped in, uh, in October 2014. The Ministry of Health did not uh, publish anymore, but um, academics could estimate the impact of this epidemic. So this was huge and is estimated about 2 million people were infected by chikungunya. At that time, the, uh, this epidemic caused havoc because there was no information from the Ministry of Health there were no reports. People were suffering from uh, rash, as you see in this girl here, and uh, horrible and very uh, debilitating joint pains in the whole body that made the people walk like this, bent. This is what it means in, in, in Swahili. Chikungunya means to walk in a bent way because of the pain. And so this misinformation caused panic and confusion in the population. This epidemic spread very rapidly through the through densely populated uh, areas in the cities, especially at a speed of nine meters per day. So was, that's pretty fast. Um, people could not find medication, and a similar situation happened with Zika. So, in view of the lack of data, the academics and researchers uh, resorted to alternative means. For instance, Twitter. Um, in this map on the right, this shows the tweets that people send when they had a Zika infection. And with this, we could sort of trace how the Zika epidemic was moving through the country. Um, also, data that was sort of gathered by unpublished health reports from the Ministry of Health that could be uh, uh, yeah, got in a way sort of underground. This was used also to do estimates. And the estimates at the end showed that what the official figures were showing was very underestimated. For instance, in chikungunya, the, um, the real or more real estimations were 57 times higher than those reported officially. The next and um, but the biggest epidemic that we have now is also transmitted by mosquito. This is malaria. Malaria is a parasite that infects the red blood cells, but also other tissues in the body. And it's transmitted by a different mosquito than the other the viruses that I showed before. This mosquito is called Anopheles, and this one bites at night. Malaria has been uh, controlled uh, in Venezuela for many years, but currently uh, Latin America also made uh, really big advances in diminishing the cases and decrease. The graph on the left shows, for instance, Brazil. Colombia and Peru diminishing their number of cases, but except for Venezuela, who has been the outlier in the Americas, where there has been a huge increase in the number of cases in the population. And this is shown in this graph where we see that through the years from 2000 to 2017, there has been a, a, about 2000% increase in the cases, especially again from 2013, 14 onwards. And we expect that by the end of this year, there will be about a million cases. This is a, the biggest epidemic ever, not only in the country, but actually in the Americas, and is the, the fastest uh, increase in epidemic in the world of malaria. We expect also about 1,500 deaths by this time. So malaria is really impacting the country, and it has spread from this southern focus. Malaria, uh, by looking at this map, map, I remember that malaria actually existed only in the Amazon area, where I also used to work, and this area down here, because it's, it's forest, difficult to control. The rest of the country was, there was no malaria. And Venezuela was, in fact, the first WHO, uh, so World Health Organization, certified country to eliminate malaria um, <clears throat> in most of 90% of its territory in the 60s. However, in this hotspot, what is called the, uh, the southern focus on the left, on the right, um, uh, is from where malaria has spread. These are remote regions that are where the health attention is much lower. And also, I show you also that the other, the other factor. And from here, the, the disease has spread to the rest of the country. The main uh, factor that has been linked to this spread is the illegal mining that, that takes place in, the, in this area. 
And what happened that because of the uh, socioeconomic crisis, people that are looked for uh, to, to get more earnings, then they decide also to go to these remote places where the illegal minings are, where the, the living conditions are, are very bad, where you are completely exposed to malaria because the mosquito likes to breed in this type of waters. And so these people get infected with malaria and then they go back home to other regions in Venezuela, bringing malaria with them and therefore expanding. Um, this is actually happening also in the border region with Brazil, which is down here. And this is for you to remember later. Um, the crisis is also increasing the suffering of these people that actually now have uh, contracted malaria because of the health system collapse. There are no materials or very little materials for the diagnosis of malaria, but also for treatment. And this is exactly in that area where we see an increasing number of people waiting, hoping to be received some treatment, but also then dying. Now, the next epidemic is a different one, or it's a different disease, which was completely controlled. And these are vaccine preventable diseases. And the first one you may know is measles. We have now a measles epidemic, incredible in the country where uh, before the Venezuela was actually one of uh, one of the countries with a very good uh, program, a vaccination programs for children, but for adults. Since 2007, there had been no case reported in the country, but 10 years later, measles came back. And and this has been linked to the progressive interruption of vaccination. Now, measles, unfortunately, is affecting mainly um, indigenous populations. These are very vulnerable populations because the immunity is, is uh, very naive. They, they have not been exposed to many diseases. In the graph below, you see the, the uh, process of the epidemic, which started more or less at mid-2017, uh, so last year, and has uh, produced up to now about 9,000 cases. And uh, it's been estimated around 135 deaths, but we believe it's an underestimate because we have reports from non-governmental organizations working with indigenous populations that report a much higher number. Um, and in fact, as I said, the indigenous population, especially the Yanomami people who are, inhabit the border region between Venezuela and Brazil, as shown in this map, uh, these have been the mainly affected as 92% of the deaths have occurred in these ethnic groups. Here's a picture of the Yanomami people. The diphtheria, that's the other vaccine preventable disease. Um, but this one is caused by a bacteria called Corinobacterium diphtheria. This also, like measles, is spread from human to human and via uh, little drops when you sneeze or cough. The symptoms of this disease, which is a deadly disease, are like another common cold. However, the bacteria secretes a toxin that produces, as you see in the picture below left, uh, a sort of pseudo membrane in the throat of uh, the, the people who are infected and especially children can suffocate. Therefore, it's deadly. But it should not be so. If you are vaccinated, you will not get it. And this is the, the, the sad story. So vaccination has also been progressively interrupted together with the other uh, children vaccinations. And, and despite that the disease was not reported since 1992, so more than almost 30 years ago, now it has come back. And um, since 2016, the infection, as you see, it has started also in the same area, so the, the southern focus, and has spread to uh, the rest of the country. The mortality rate is very high. It's 22% of the people that contract the disease can die. And in fact, uh, 96, almost, almost all the cases of diphtheria reported in the Americas now originate from Venezuela. So if you live in this country, as I said before, with all this happening, um, one of the alternatives that have come to many people's mind is to leave, to leave the country. I don't want to eat from garbage anymore. I don't want to 
uh, have queues in order to find food or uh, medications. And actually, even if I find the food, I cannot buy because it's so expensive. So I leave. So Venezuela, who used to be a country that really was a, a, a traditionally uh, receiving refugees and people from countries from the Americas and also from abroad, from other, from Europe. A lot of people came from Europe and established themselves in Venezuela. Now sees their people leaving. In this picture on the left, you see the bridge between Venezuela and Colombia packed with thousands of people trying to cross over to Colombia. And then from Colombia, they march, as you see in the other pictures, march through to Ecuador, to Peru, to Chile, even to Argentina in the southern part of South America, crossing the Andes and going by foot. This is a very sad situation for a, such a rich country as Venezuela is, with petrol, with minerals, with agriculture, beautiful country for tourism. How can this be happening? Now, the United Nations has reported that more than 3 million people have left the country. In this picture, actually in the news of the United Nations, they show a family of Venezuelan refugees coming to live with their relatives in Colombia. In such a situation, and, and these people also live in very poor conditions, in slums, so I, I ask myself how much they can help their Venezuelan relatives uh, to, to now live in, in Colombia, in this new country. Asylum seekers, the UN also reports that the number of applications for asylum from Venezuela have increased 2000%. And in fact, in the last uh, four years, or three years actually, they have received more than 146,000 applications for asylum. The exodus has also impacted the health system, as it is estimated that about or more than 10,000 doctors and probably the same amount of nurses have left the country. And this takes me back to that picture that I showed you initially, where the hospital where I work and, and research and also uh, where we deliver our help uh, is closing down several wards in pediatrics, in the maternity ward, and uh, because of lack of doctors and nurses. This, the exodus has also brought another problem, that when people migrate, they also take with them the diseases that they carry. And this has been mainly seen in the spillover of malaria, especially in the border between uh, Venezuela and Brazil in the southern focus, where people are crossing to Brazil through legal or illegal borders and bringing malaria to them. And in fact, our Brazilian counterparts uh, report that 80% of the cases, 80% of the malaria cases in these border municipalities like Roraima are imported from Venezuela. A similar situation is happening with measles, where up to a month ago, um, Venezuela was actually um, compiling 68% of the cases of measles for the whole of the American continent. Now it has been surpassed by Brazil. So Brazil is, is producing uh, more than 55% of the cases in the whole of the America and followed by Venezuela with 38%. And so there is an epidemic of measles in Venezuela, which seems to be very likely that it started, as we see here in this map, from the spillover of people crossing from Venezuela to Brazil in the southern focus and then spreading through the rest of the Brazilian and the country. Now, it has to be said uh, a good word um, and to praise really to the neighboring countries and non-governmental organization working in Venezuela uh, some of them sort of underground because the, the government or regime does not accept them. Um, and the ones working also in the neighboring countries where the refuge, Venezuelan refugees are. Um, they have, um, many countries have really opened the doors and have given help, a humanitarian response to Venezuela, but they are also overloaded. They cannot cope with so many, uh, with such a massive immigration into their countries. So only Latin America and the Caribbean are hosting about 2.5 million refugees, mainly Colombia with more than 1 million, Peru 
following with half a million, and then Ecuador and Argentina. Um, Europe, especially Spain and Portugal and Italy, have received uh, almost also half a million people, and then North America and Canada following after. The, for this, money is needed, funds are needed, and action from international agency. So finally, uh, some international agencies have started to move and to, to help, um, and um, really there have been people like the head of the Organization of American States, Luis Almagro, who have been pledging to help Venezuela and to, uh, to press the Venezuelan government to, to accept help. Um, but this help is starting, but it's still slow. So the United Nations and partner have appealed for uh, a help of 220 million to help Venezuelan migrants and refugees. Uh, these partners of, of an, an agency of the UN, so sort of the Central Emergency Response Fund, have already allocated about 20 million earlier this year uh, for help. And people such as Angelina Jolie, as in this picture, who was a special envoy of the United Nations Refugee Agency, who went to Peru um, in October this year, are helping very much to bring attention to the situation of the uh, crisis in and out of Venezuela. However, the humanitarian response so far is mainly concentrated in the refugees and migrants, because that's the help where the agencies can reach the countries allow the neighboring countries are allowing this help to come in however it is still difficult uh, still difficult and slow to help within venezuela therefore we call for action venezuela has really endured uh, many years of upheaval in the political social and economic arena and our country is in crisis as i've shown measles and other vaccine preventable diseases have come back malaria is spreading in the whole country killing people but also spreading to neighboring countries so what to do international authorities governments and global and hemispheric authorities should really press the venezuelan government to allow a humanitarian channel to bring help, to bring relief, to me bring medication, and people that want to work, especially us Venezuelans, would go back immediately to Venezuela to help. International intervention is needed. We need to stop the spread of these diseases not within Venezuela because they are spreading through the regions. And so all the gains and efforts that have been done in the Americas to control and to diminish diseases are now being threatened by this crisis and epidemics that are uh, increasingly coming in Venezuela. And we expect more and more of these epidemics. Venezuela is dying of hunger. We need help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tom, for that very informative and, and interesting presentation. Um, we are now at the point of the webinar where we can take questions from the audience. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question directly to Dr. Tommy, uh, we are able to unmute your microphone and you may ask your question. Uh, you can also send them via the chat feature as well. So um, let's open it up to questions. Yes, I would like to make a question. Yeah, go ahead, Elaine. Okay, Dr. Tani, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. That you presented a very, very complex situation. We we don't even know how to begin to address the question, uh, to address the crisis. But one thing that came to my mind is the vector-borne diseases and these kind of diseases normally reach their high transmission period during the rainy season. Uh, as long as there's already an emergency occurring 
do you know if there's any measures that are ongoing, any preparedness measures to respond the possibility and the, in fact the, the expected growth for vector borne diseases in the upcoming season? Yes, uh, thank you, Elaine. Yeah, these vector borne diseases, um, there are, in fact, uh, if we talk about malaria, um, where we are seeing, of course, the mosquito uh, uh, breeds um, um, in, in, yeah, not at home, uh, mainly like, like, for instance, the mosquito that transmits the viruses. Um, the help that we are having, but it's again not enough. So the Pan American Health Organization is acting within the country and it has brought uh, treatment, um, although unfortunately it's not enough really for, for, uh, to really uh, stop the whole epidemic. And so the main thing they have brought is treatment and mosquito nets, and they have been distributed by, um, by the government officers. Um, so the Pan American Health Organization cannot act, they, they, the people of the uh, PAHO cannot act themselves and, and go directly to the people to distribute. They have to do it through the Ministry of Health and their workers. So um, uh, in that respect, it's difficult to um, see how this is being done. We know that there, are, there is willingness from some people within the Ministry of Health to really curb the epidemic and to go to the most um, hot places, let's say, where the, where the epidemic is big, like this, this southern focus, um, to bring help, to bring the mosquito nets and to bring treatment. Uh, however, um, uh, when I once, uh, a couple of months ago, discussed this with um, a WHO uh, World Health Organization officer in Geneva, um, they also said that the money they can bring, the funds that the, both WHO and PAHO can bring is really not enough to stop this. So your question is right. I mean, the, the, the next rainy season may bring even more uh, havoc and more spread of the, of the malaria epidemic if action is not done now, when, when we are starting or the, the dry season. And uh, we see a little bit of help, but um, unfortunately not enough. So we need to see, we hope that with what we are doing also with this webinar, we are also bringing information and pressing also international agencies and the uh, Venezuelan government to open up the doors to proper help, especially from neighboring countries. So in neighboring countries, Brazil, they are of course acting against malaria and, and trying to stop it in their side but they are also overwhelmed, especially in the areas in the Southern Focus and Roraima is also areas which are remote and perhaps with not all the, the um, uh, help that, that needs to be done. Um, with respect, I wanted also to say, with respect to the other uh, uh, vector borne diseases like dengue and, and uh, especially dengue, which is transmitted by Aedes, because we have now this problem of uh, people storing water at home, then the rainy season is, is, is a factor, but it's not so big because the mosquitoes have a constant breeding site at, at home the whole year. And that is why we are seeing that especially dengue and maybe uh, the other two diseases are being transmitted throughout, throughout the year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. um, further questions? Uh, Sandra, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Uh, appears that Sandra may have stepped away. I did get a question through the chat feature uh, asking if there are any MSF teams, uh, Doctors Without Borders, currently working in Venezuela. Um, yes, they are actually there, and MSF is, has been doing a great job, especially in the malaria epidemic. Uh, unfortunately, the government has in somehow banned uh, MSF to, from working, so they are still there, they're still managing to work, 
uh, like them, other several other NGOs uh, which are not being uh, recognized by the regime. Um, they are still working and they keep doing their job uh, in sort of in an anonymous way. So we are very thankful because these are some of the organizations that have that are making a difference. Uh, in Venezuela. And one of the main ones is actually Caritas from Venezuela. They are very vocal and very uh, 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 moving a lot and moving a lot of uh, resources, um, finding innovative ways to bring help in. Um, so this must be very much recognized. Thank you for the question. Okay, we have another question that came in via the chat. Um, it's a question just clarifying whether uh, UN assistance is being accepted or not by the Venezuelan government. Well, it seems that it's sort of been accepted now. It, the problem is that it's, it's not clear. You know, the, the government, um, there is some noise. The government has several voices. And, and uh, while there are some voices that want and do accept, there are other voices that don't. And this is why it's also complex. It's a political situation. Uh, however, since uh, um, Maduro went uh, last, uh, the, the, a few months ago, was in front of the UN, at least admitting that there was a, a crisis in Venezuela, although he wrongly blames, and I want to clarify this, he blamed that there is a, um, a blockade uh, by how, what he calls the in, in, in empire of the U.S. This is uh, definitely not so because the, the blockade is they are blocking the people who are connected to the regime and who have been proven to have uh, committed uh, criminal actions, either in corruption or narco trafficking. So um, definitely now there is sort of a perhaps a, a little window open for the United Nations help to come in, but it's, it's still not completely clear uh, how this works. And in any case, the United Nations also needs to bring the help, but give it to the government. So it, it will deliver it by the government at the end, by the Venezuelan government at the end. And this is difficult in, in order to quantify and, and control how is it going to be delivered. But in any case, it's is always better than nothing. Great, so we've got a few more questions. Um, everyone seems to want to send them to me to ask. So uh, we have a shy group today, that's okay. Uh, so there's another question, um, this is actually from Sandra, who uh, has indicated she's having some audio issues. And her question is, what is Dr. Tommy's perspective on the way governments and ministries of health in the Americas have addressed the crisis? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm pretty critical. I think that um, already long ago, there should have been a much stronger response. Um, I think they have been very good in, in certain countries to open up the doors and to help the Venezuelan refugees. And we are all thankful for that. But I believe that uh, if we don't solve the problem within Venezuela, we cannot solve the problem. And, and the problem for the other countries is just going to increase. So the action uh, to halt the crisis and to reverse the crisis and to halt the spread of diseases has to be done within Venezuela, in the country, because this is the focus and it will continue to produce problems. And um, so I, I, and I think I'm not alone in this, uh, we feel that um, the response from the governments in general could be much stronger uh, as a one voice in the Americas. Uh, unfortunately, as in anywhere, there are interests which come into play and um, yeah, damage this uh, possibility to have a one block uh, opinion. Thank you, Sandra. I hope this answers your question. All right, we have yeah. a few more. Dr. Tani, I have another question. May I, Andrew? Oh, go ahead. Perfect. Yes. Uh, as you, you already said, you know, uh, health professionals are, are leaving the country. So 
I, I, I completely understand the situation. They don't even receive enough to deal with their families and to have a decent life. But I, I, I do understand that there are many others that still in the country and trying to uh, do their duties, their everyday duties in healthcare. How professionals are dealing with the daily routines in healthcare, in the health system, in the public health, in the private ones. How these people are doing, are facing this crisis, and thinking mainly in, in a psychological perspective that this must be a, a, a challenge to a health professional to every day go and see this complex situation. So do you know if there are any studies doing with these people? Think there are news about this? Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Uh, and you're completely right. And, and this is really the, the human side of the whole situation. Um, because, uh, you know, apart from suffering yourself uh, when you live there, uh, suffering the situation, having to deal, you know, when you go out of your house and even when you are at home, you are afraid of, uh, you know, being robbed. That's one of the things the, the, you don't feel safe in the country anymore. You don't feel safe in the streets day or night. Uh, people don't usually try not to go out at night because it's, 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 uh, it's very dangerous. So uh, doctors that, that are on call and that would need to go to the hospitals to see patients when they, there is an emergency, um, sometimes, well, they cannot or they would not because they may risk their lives. Others do. So apart from caring for their own lives, uh, and you're right, when they have to go to either private or public care, especially public, they are faced with the deterioration of, of everything. I mean, I can tell you my own experience, uh, and, and I go at least twice a year to Venezuela, and I stay there a month or two every time because we are running some uh, projects on vector bone diseases in Zika, in this case, and with pregnant women. And in the maternity world where we work, well, you wouldn't just not believe the the the, the situation. In in first place, the electricity. Uh, uh, is cut down uh, several times a day, several times a week. Um, the toilets are all broken down. So the, the, really, it's horrible to say it here, but there is smell of urine in the whole maternity. Um, the, the, the women, because our women, pregnant women, really care for, for their babies, they make an extreme effort to come to, to the uh, prenatal or antenatal clinics. And the main problem that, that they have and that we have uh, to, to give them care is that the transport, so there are no buses because uh, to, to come because the, the buses are all broken down. Uh, there are no spare parts uh, to buy. If there are, they're too expensive to repair the bus. So, so basic things like this uh, are, are, are not possible to, to, um, to have in Venezuela. Um, so, I would say that I very much admire my colleagues in Venezuela. Some of them are actually young people that have decided purposely to stay in Venezuela and to continue working, not only in the health sector, but in other ones. Some of them work with non-governmental organizations. Uh, I really admire them because they are young, they have dreams, they would like to have a future and to work in better uh, situation, and they decide to stay and fight and care for their country. And the same people, uh, all, the, all the other uh, health personnel at different ages, also old ones. Um, I would say that there is a spirit of solidarity. What I've seen developing in these years is uh, solidarity among, uh, among ourselves and helping each other from the point of having WhatsApp groups to discuss cases, to uh, ask where can you find these medications or these other, because I have a patient who, I ca who cannot find the medication, and, and, and even for themselves. Uh, so um, there is an increase in depression. This has been documented. And actually, currently, we are running a, a small project on resilience 
uh, both for the pregnant women, but also for the health personnel to see what motivates them. And uh, the women, what mainly they say, the pregnant women, they said that what, what motivates them to go ahead are their children, their family. Um, other people also uh, get their help in, in, in God, in religion. And, um, and also on their own, in their own beliefs and ideals. So I must say that um, I'm very much in praise of, of most of my own people. I think most of the people in Venezuela are people that want peace, that want things to work properly. And there's just a minority who unfortunately see it in a different way. So thank you, Elaine, for this question. Great. We, we have another question from the remote audience. We're getting close to the top of the hour here, um, but if we can maybe squeeze this last question. I see that Charles Henke has his hand raised. Charles, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute your microphone so you can ask your question. You there, Charles? Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Tammy, uh, thank you very much. Um, having been a uh, disaster responder with uh, National Disaster Medical System, it's um, very important to hear uh, actual testimony about what's happening in Venezuela. Um, the two questions that I have uh, just, I mean, to me this sounds like almost like a genocide of the Venezuelan people. Um, if so, would that allow the UN to be able to do more um, aggressive and, and drastic measures to try to help the, the uh, country itself? Thank you. There's a lot of noise. Thank you, Charles. Do you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I think you have to uh, mute your phone. There is some a noise from your side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, for your question. Well, you, you would think so. And in fact, this is my own question. Um, why is not enough what is happening to have the UN, WHO and other uh, international agencies to act already now? What is stopping them? I mean, what they have told me is that they need the agreement or that the government declares that there is a humanitarian crisis. They will never do. So my question is also this, is this not enough? Is what we are seeing not enough? And you are right. Some of us have already said that this is a genocide. It is, of course. And, and what happens is that what they uh, shield, uh, shield themselves after is they say, well, the problem is that the, it's, a, it's a situation which is not clear because the country is not in war. So we cannot uh, really decide to take uh, uh, you know, an intervention and say, you know, and as a, a peaceful intervention, we don't want anybody throwing bombs or rockets to Venezuela, not at all. It's peaceful intervention what we want. We want to have uh, the possibility that, 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 that the UN and that other neighboring countries bring help and, and hold this situation. Um, and so, yeah. I have the same question as you. So I hope that with all this that we're doing, there will come soon the point where there will be some peaceful intervention from outside because we really, Venezuelans alone cannot do it anymore. We have been protesting for years and as we have only been killed by the regime. Unfortunately, that's how it is. Thank you. And Charles, did you have a follow-up question you wanted to ask? I, I, yeah, I did. Um, the other, the other question I have for you, Doctor, is speaking out as you are now. Are you in fear that the Venezuelan government will try to, I don't know, do something against you? Or, I mean, it, from what I'm hearing, it, it really sounds like there's a lack of sympathy or empathy from the ruling government. Yeah, my answer is yes. And um, but to tell you the truth, there are people who uh, have been much more brave than me that are, are within Venezuela constantly uh, uh, denouncing the situation. And um, well, maybe they have some type of protection, which I don't have. I hope also not to 
yeah, to be allowed to go back to the country and not uh, not have further problems. But you know, uh, I think they know my position, um, and I've been trying to uh, to be neutral in the way of if I need to help people, I just help people. It doesn't matter uh, who they are, or what their their beliefs are. So I bring my flag is I bring help in the health uh, uh, healthcare context, and um, but I think they know my position. I'm not a politician and I'm not running for any political positions and I don't wish to. Um, so I hope that I'm not a threat for them in this respect. But of course, yeah, all of us who are um, vocalizing these problems uh, are concerned from, for, our own, for our own safety, yes. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions from uh, the audience. We have a couple that have come in that are pretty similar to the last few questions, sort of asking about the political situation and its impact on the health situation. So uh, we are at the top of the hour, and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, I would like to thank everyone for participating in the webinar and Dr. Tommy for presenting for us. Um, did you have any closing comments you wanted to make before we end the webinar, Dr. Tommy? Yes, um, once more I would like to thank uh, Wadam, your organization and, and all of you really to again giving, uh, not really me, but, but the country to speak through me and, and to reach and thank you to all the people that came and that participated in this uh, webinar today. And I hope you can be also ambassadors of uh, this uh, situation, uh, especially in in the first world, where sometimes Venezuela seems to be far away, far away, especially from Europe. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and thank you again.